Oh, this is uh, uh, Nima D. Reader of the Department of Stats in, in Glasgow. Adrian Bowen sold the Papa. Uh, I've got who's dead there now. Well, we actually not a department of statistics anymore. We're a school of mathematics and statistics. Um, oh. But the head of stats is Janine Elian. Yeah, I know. It's not formally at uh, St Andrews. So, okay. so uh, I needed to come talk to us today about uh, this uh, automatic architecture selection. So she's using uh, Apache and the uh, And I, I met uh, Nico in Calabria. Uh, I fell, uh, uh, I think, last September. And she gave a very good uh, synopsis of the stock over 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and uh, I think that would be all right. Very interesting area. And so we are very pleased to have it today to expand in this area. Thank you very much. Very much. As the title says, I'm going to be talking about automatic architecture selection for hierarchical mixture of expert models, but I'm not assuming anyone has seen any part of that before, so we're going to start from scratch. Uh, this is joint work with a former colleague, Ludger Evers, who's now left academia, and as is usual, the PhD student who did the project was doing the bulk of the work. That's Ivana Barana-Kasha. Uh, so she did all the coding and stuff on this. So... Hierarchical mixture of experts models are useful because essentially they treat a large, complex, global problem as a series of small, localized, separate problems. So it's one of the divide and conquer methods. So the divide step being that we break down the large problem into smaller subproblems, which we hope will be much simpler and easier to solve and can be solved efficiently. And then the conquer step is where we join up all those solutions to essentially make the local solutions global again. So it's a nice approach because it adapts locally to complexity. Um, so there's a very so an area of data where there's a very simple relationship between your variables. You can model it simply, and then there, there's a lot of areas where it becomes complex. You can split them up so they become simple locally. It's easy to code in parallel, which is useful in terms of computational efficiency. It's a nice interpretation as well, because you can look at how the complexity of the surface changes across the different subparts. It does allow for flexible modeling of uh, relationships. So, you know, it, it, what we're going to be talking about a lot today is uh, regression. So relationships between the outcome variable and covariates, and that can change depending on what part of the covariate space you're in. It does also allow for heteroscedasticity. So you're not just modeling the mean surface, you're also modeling the variance. So if there's one part of the area where there's a lot of heteroscedasticity, you can model that separately to the other parts where there's homoscedasticity. So that is sort of an advantage above and beyond things like GAMS, uh, which are very popular, obviously, in being flexible in mean modeling. Examples of divide and conquer are classification and regression trees, you know, where you split the space into various areas and you predict on each of those sub areas. Uh, which is really a, an analogous to what we're going to be doing here. Uh, random forests, so joining up a lot of trees. Mixture of experts, which I'll introduce, and then obviously what I'm talking about today, which is hierarchical mixture of experts. So the big challenge about this is it's all very well to say that we can divide and conquer, but how do we start the divide step? How do we find ways of splitting the space sensibly and efficiently so that we can find areas where it's simple to uh, solve the, the effective relationship between variables? Okay, so I'm going to start with finite mixture models, which um, is my sort of backyard. I did my PhD in model-based clustering, so this is an area that I really enjoy. Uh, it's an idea of extending beyond a single parametric distribution or relationship across a population into subpopulations where each of the subpopulations has its own density or has its own relationship. And then those are summed together and weighted to give an overall density for the population. So each of these FEs is essentially a component probability density function. So it's still pro pro probability density. It's greater than zero, it integrates to one. But there are multiple ones for the multiple subpopulations, and those are known as components. We always see each of those components has its own parameter vector. So for example, if we're just looking at, say, rather than a relationship between an outcome and covariates, if we're just looking at covariates, we could look at sort of continuous being modeled as multivariate normal, where each multivariate normal has its own mean and its own covariance parameter for each of the different components. 
the pi of E is basically the mixing um, weight, which says what proportion of the population falls into that particular subpopulation. And so when you sum all of those up together, essentially that gives you a density for the overall population. So examples of this are, as I said before, model-based clusterings, or you could think about each of these as being a conditional Gaussian, so a linear regression. And so this would then give you a mixture of regressions. So this is all very well. I mean, it allows flexibility. So if you have multiple nodes in your data show or multiple types of regression lines that fit your model, that's great. But it doesn't try and tell you where these things activate. So these pies basically say across all the population, we have 30% this, 20% that, but it doesn't change according to where you are in the covariate space. So that's where a mixture of experts comes in. So it's, again, as I said before, a divide and conquer methods, but the only difference between the previous equation and this is that we now have a subscript on the pies, mixing weights. So that's the probability of belonging to that particular component. So that changes now depending on what your observation looks like. So you use covar covariates um, like X's, and you can then essentially create what we call logistic, um, logistic models to predict which expert you belong to, which component you belong to, which model should be used. So, you know, if you're one area of space, you might be predicted to be in component one, which has one particular regression, maybe pointing up. If you're another area of space, you might have a regression line that's pointing down. So it's breaking the space down, the covariate space down, according to which of the models should work best. And so that's a good deal more flexible than the mixture model approach. Just notationally, basically, the probability of mixing weight of being in component I for observation, uh, component E for being observation I, is just then this exponential of the covariate vector for the I's observation times the parameter vector for that particular component. And then we divide by the sum of those across all the different components. In order to allow identifiability, we're going to set the first of the experts' parameter vectors to be zero. Um, so you essentially become one over this one plus expert exponential for this. And all of these obviously have to sum to one because these are probabilities, these are proportions. So for every observation, we have a certain probability of being in each of the components. So if I have probability 0.9 and 0.1, then I'm really likely to be belong to component one. And the relationship that's modeled there is probably mostly what's going to drive the relationship with that particular observation. Hierarchical mixture of experts. As you expect from the word hierarchical, we just throw a tree on it, basically. The way of splitting up the space becomes this hierarchical tree. So we have an architecture made up of nodes and edges. So our boxes here represent the nodes, and the lines joining them are the edges. This, you can see, is an example of a tree where we have only two sons and daughters for each of the gates, so each of the nodes. So this is a binary tree. Uh, we stick with that for most of what we're talking about today. You could expand beyond it, but I think most of the time, if, you, if your binary doesn't work, you just add greater depth. And so it's possible to really approximate even non-binary tree uh, architectures fairly well with binary trees. As I said here, we have two types of nodes. We have gate nodes, which are sort of internal nodes, and we have expert nodes, which are the terminal nodes for leaves. And so those experts essentially are those components we were talking about before. Once you hit expert one, you have a particular component density that has a relationship for observations that fall into that leaf for how we would model the relationship between the variables there. The gates are the sort of ones that internally direct you down towards the different terminal nodes or experts. All good so far? All right. So if we have a particular architecture, and so this one is a particular example of um, so four internal um, gates and five expert uh, leaves. We obviously have to find a way of going from the top, the root node, down to one of the leaps, um, one of the experts. And so we're going to do that by using those logistic gates, same as we had before for the pies. So you have a particular covariate effect for i observation. We have some gamma, which tells us what's the probability from going from G1 to G2 or G1 to G3. And so essentially we've got this soft partition that's, you know, we go from G1 to G2, maybe G2 to G4, and then finally G4 to E4. And there's a certain probability of going to that based on the probability of going on this edge to this edge to this edge. So it's 
essentially just taking those pies and making them products of probabilities along the edges. What we're eventually using in the next hierarchical mixture of experts is still that probability of being in that expert and then using that component density to model observations that fall on that expert. That's exactly where we end up at. So for each of the experts, we have that prior pro that mixing probability, uh, for which is particular to each observation because we use the gates based on the observations covariance. So these are what are known as path probabilities. And so every single expert you see has a unique path. So if we're going, well, as long as we're only allowed to go downwards, if we're going upwards, we can probably loop the loop. But if we're going downwards from the root node G1, you know, if we want to get to E2, we have to go from G1 to G3 and G3 to E2. And so we can define those path probabilities based on the product of the, path, the edges that we took. And those products are related to the exponential um, logistic formulation that we talked about before. If that seemed like a lot, basically just take it as a tree. Probability going from here, probability going to here, product of those gives us the probability of being needed. That's sort of how it works. You have to model all of those. So this is what we're learning when we're doing our mixture of experts. We're learning those gammas given a fixed architecture, and we're also learning the parameters within those those conditional densities down the in the experts, the ones that are actually modeling the relationships. Once we get down to an expert, we have a mo model that tells us what is happening there. And so in general formulation, we have these thetas and we have a vector of thetas for each one of the experts, which we also have to estimate. In the special case of Gaussian experts, which I'm going to talk about a lot, we have this conditional Gaussian y given x is equal to x times beta for the mean and sigma squared for the variance. So we have these linear regression models. And so each one of these thetas is just going to be a vector beta and a variance, variance parameter sigma squared. So even if we had a straight line that was over the entire space, I'm not going to draw because I think I'll be outside of people in, in, uh, in Zoom or whatever. But even if we had a straight line which narrowed and widened along the line, this would work because we'd have the same betas across these, but sigma squared would change depending on where you were in the x's. So that would take care of your heteroscedasticity. If you had a line that went up and down, then the betas would change according to where the x's are. So you can, the first part, you'd be, have a, a beta that was increasing, and the second part, second expert, you'd have a beta that's decreasing. And that's the equation that we come back to all the time, right? These path probabilities, which are just products of the edge probabilities summed over the components times the component densities, and that gives us our overall model for the space. Okay, so we can say that the max, the mixture of experts model is actually a special case of the hierarchical mixture of experts model because it's just basically a hierarchy of depth one. So we would have G1 goes to E1, E2, E3, E4. That's essentially what mixture of experts. In addition to these path probabilities, which tell us the probability of any particular set of covariates being in a particular expert, we can also talk about how the modeling goes. So this is a responsibility. So this is multiplying the path times the actual model for that expert, and then dividing it by the sum across all models, because this is essentially a soft partition. So we're interested in how each of these contribute to what we would predict for those particular observations. Downside of um, HMEs, and I'm going to stop saying hierarchical mixture of experts and just use HMEs from now on. You can't really find the maximum likelihood in closed form, which is a pain. You can do numerical optimization, obviously, but the usual frequentist approach to estimation is creating some latent variables and using the expectation maximization algorithm or variants of that to solve it. We actually use an element of the latent variables in the Bayesian, so I'm going to Bayesian approach, so I'm going to talk about those now and then sort of move quickly on. So if you've seen clustering or mixture models in that setting, you this is probably going to look pretty familiar. It's basically we introduce these latent variables that tell us whether or not we're in a particular expert or in a particular gate, if we're observation I. So that's all it's doing. It's basically a binary vector with one if Z I E, if the expert for the I um, observation is equal to E and zero otherwise. So it's just telling us, hey, you're an expert one or hey, you're an expert four. You can define it as well for the path probabilities and the edges. So you can say, okay, if you're an observation, I, then you will go down path G1 to G3, but you won't go down path G1 to G2. 
that changes our likelihood for the parameters phi, which are going to be, remember, our gammas, which give us the pi's, and our thetas, which are the actual component density parameters. So here we would have a product of a sum, which is not ideal because we take the log, we can take a product out, but we can't take the sum out. If we introduce these latent variable z and we have a complete likelihood, then that becomes a product over observations and then the product over the experts in the HME of the mixing proportion times the component density for E to the power of whether or not that observation falls into E. So if this is one, then we call this out. If it's zero, it vanishes. And this also gives a, a multinomial for the density of these vectors of allocation parameters given the gating parameters. So that becomes a multinomial as well. We're interested in that. It's helpful for sampling later on. Okay. Bad side about frequentists. And I'm fighting against myself here because I'm fundamentally a frequentist who's been dragged kicking and screaming into the Bayesian world. Um, but there are bad sides about this. EM algorithm is known to have really great leaps and increases in log likelihood in the first few iterations and then tail off hugely. So it can be really slow to converge. And that's not ideal if, you know, why would we know that tree structure in advance? It's more likely that we're gonna propose a couple or many and have to fit all of them and choose between them somehow. So it's slow, that's not great. You can only obviously do this if you actually know the tree structure. And why would you know that? If I gave you a problem and said, hey, what's the tree structure for this? I wouldn't know it. Why would you? So the nice thing about why we have to be dragged kicking and screaming into the Bayesian approach is it allows us to actually automatically select the architecture for the tree. So we can learn from the data. And that's ideal for the divide and conquer strategy because it automatically lets the data drive where you put experts. So. If we're going to do Bayesian, we have to have likelihood and priors. And if we're going to do MCMC, we also have to have proposals. And this is where it starts to get a little bit nitty gritty. It was bad before. I'd be worried. Now it's definitely really bad. So for those of you who have seen a lot of Bayesian stuff, this isn't going to be that fascinating. We have our pr parameters. Remember, are always going to be these gating parameters, these logistic parameter vectors for each of the edges. And we have then the parameters for the expert component densities, which are actually doing the model. So as long as these are continuous, which makes sense, a gamma is, and depending on the circumstance, these should be, we have multivariate normal priors with some means and some covariance. Usually, we will set these things to be the same across all experts, across all gates. Um, there's no particular reason for why we set the priors differently. So these tend to be all formulated the same. So you only at least have to do it once. But you do still have to think about, well, what the hell should a mean be for this? And what should the covariance be? What's my prior information? Then once we have those priors, we can do MCMC um, a couple of different ways. Uh, given a fixed architecture, using Metropolis Hastings, and if we've conjugacy, we can use Gibson. So we also have to update those latent variables, right? The ones that identify which expert you fall into. So in addition to getting updates for each chain of the gammas and the thetas, we have these Zs. So particular gate G, and then a set of allocation variables for all the observations for that gate G. We know that then among those, there'll be zeros and ones, depending on whether or not an observation belongs to that gate. And so if we add those up, we're going to get the number of observations for which that's going to be equal to one, for which that observation is in gate G. So once you're in particular gate G, you then can look down your tree and say how many terminal nodes to send from that. Uh, and that's going to be a subset of your overall um, terminal nodes, unless you're at the root. Uh, so we're going to denote that E dash, basically. For each of those points that falls into that particular gate, then we can calculate the probability, essentially, of being, for that observation, of being in one of those experts. And that comes back to exactly what we said before. We have a component density for that expert times the product of those path probabilities we had before for everything after that gate G. So, you know, if we're looking at gate three, then we only have to do these two path probabilities. If I'm looking at gate two, G2, then I have to do about four of these things. So this is basically a probability then for that observation belonging to that expert. And so for each of those, we'll sum to one. And we can allocate randomly that expert, that observation to one of these experts according to those probabilities. 
Then once we have those, we can update our gating and expert parameters. So we can use Metropolis Hastings algorithm with that uh, normal proposal, which is the usual thing we use when we're looking at continuous parameters. The usual choice if you've done Metropolis Hastings is to set the mean for the proposal parameter at the value of the previous iteration, right? It's a symmetric proposal. It means it cancels out and the acceptance probability is really nice. That's fine. I'll talk about why that's not fine later. Um, selecting the variance is non-trivial. I'm not, I'm not going to give you any sort of uh, lies about that. You do actually have to tailor this stuff. You still do, as you do with every MCMC thing that you have to do. So you're going to have to try some out, see if it gets good acceptance rates, and then tailor that. The problem with us is when we get later down the line to automatic architecture um, selection, is we're adding and removing nodes. So if I have a gate, or an expert that suddenly become a gate with two new nodes, those two new nodes don't have any previous parameter values to draw from. So there's nothing I can do for proposal if I'm centering those at previous values. So that causes a problem with that approach. And you have to be really, really smart about some of these new gate proposals, because if you don't give a sensible proposal for these things, then you're much less likely to accept. And this, again, causes problems in terms of mixing and convergence. So the modified proposal distribution that we had, or just the MCMC for a fixed tree, hierarchy, tree structure, was basically to use the data that we see. We have these allocation variables. For any particular expert or gate, we know what observations are falling there. So we can actually take it like an individual problem, say, OK, if I'm doing a logistic regression on this, this is my data. I can absolutely find the maximum likelihood estimate for this. But I need to include the weights, which are these sets, right? So this becomes an iteratively weighted least squares problem. So we're centering it at essentially the best guess we have based on the data that's been put in that expert or in that gate. And then the sigma is essentially coming out from the official information from this stuff. So you get the best guess, as would be in the frequentus case, of where these parameters are. So that's going to be really nice in terms of centering your proposals. Your variance covariance is going to follow the direction of the target distribution. So you're again going to not, if you're varying, you're going to be varying in the right direction, basically. So this is cheating <laughs> a little bit. But it is essentially the only thing we come up with, particularly when you have cases where you had no prior information. So this is obviously not a symmetric uh, proposal, so you do have to take an account of this in the MCMC, Metropolis Hastings, but it adapts all the time to each node, and it's going to give really good acceptance rates, which in hierarchical mixture of experts is a real problem for Bayesian approaches. Okay, so I'm not going to talk too much about this. I'm going to assume that you've seen Bayesian stuff and seen sort of the hairy caterpillar um, chain plots and the Gelman-Rubin convergence diagnostic and the idea of mixing as proposed by effective sample size. So moving on then to special case, because everything's been very nebulous so far. Again, we're going to work in the HME where we have regressions as our experts, basically, then the Gaussian experts case. So we can set up a conjugate which is really nice because then we can both use Gibbs sampling and also integrate some of these parameters out if we want to do a collapse sampling. So it's a classical normal inverse Gaussian where the um, prior for beta given sigma squared for each of the experts is just going to be multivariate normal with some vector beta and then sigma squared times some matrix V. And obviously you have to set those matrices. Quite often for beta we set the vector to be zero because if it's standardized data, that's basically saying the intercept is equal to the mean and we don't think any particular covariate has an effect. And so then the data pulls that away from that when that's your prior. We also then have, as the last part of this, the inter inverse gamma prior for sigma squared, which allows that conjugacy. So then when we have these priors along with our normal, um, normal expert uh, component densities, that gives us a nice posterior with the same form of normal inverse gamma. And I'm going to assume that, again, you're not going to be that interested in some of these. It works out really nice, and if you've done a Bayesian course with conjugacy, some of this will seem really linear. One thing to note is that this is going to be conditioned only on the points that belong to that particular expert. So it's not going to be all of the points. It's using those allocation variables, again, to say which points are actually relevant to 
And so this again becomes some sort of weighted mean essentially between the prior mean for beta plus the standard uh, OLS estimate for beta, more or less. And A and B are updated according to the number of experts that are actually put in there. And B is sort of a difference between the um, the difference of the prior uh, estimates and the posterior estimates. Uh, as I said, uh, I promise I'm going to get past priors into actual modeling soon. Um, they're usually centered at zero if we standardize data because that basically says, okay, we're assuming a priori that none of these covariates have an effect on y. So the x's don't actually, be, the betas for the x are all zero, so they don't affect y. And so then there has to be information on the data to suggest otherwise for it to pull away from that. Variance, you actually have to make decisions on this and it's based on the idea of how steep you expect your regression lines to be. Now you can sort of look at data and get an idea for that. Um, and the range of the response should also be looked at when you're trying to get the variability of that intercept parameter as well. The nice thing about the inverse gamma is that it has a little bit of a preference for smaller variances um, when you set these parameters to the usual settings that most people use. The nice thing about that is if you think about it, if I have a couple of regression lines that are really different, but the variability around them is huge, then points could potentially be, belong to any of them. So the smaller the variance around those regression lines, the more tightly these things are allocated to different experts. So we do actually want to try and have a little bit less variability. Okay, so this I will say, I'm not going to say too much about. I, we looked in Ivana's thesis at three different ways of sampling these things. So the standard sampling is, hey, we have these latent variables, these allocation variables, and we sample from those, we sample from gamma, um, beta, and sigma squared. Second sample we looked at was the brute force. Uh, so we don't actually include latent variables at all. We have that nasty sum for the um, likelihood and it becomes quite expensive to it, calculate all of these things. And the third one is a nice sort of byproduct of that conjugacy. You can actually integrate out all of the expert parameters for posterior predictive values for Y. So you can actually update the gammas and the Zs and completely ignore updating the betas and sigmas. That's nice. It's a smaller set of parameters to move around, so you potentially have less problems with acceptance. Downside is if you're interested in interpreting these things, they're not available to you, right? So there's upsides and downsides. We looked at these in terms of convergence and mixing um, and also computational time and found that sampler one is sort of a good compromise. Sampler three was good, but again, interpretability is not ideal, and it also takes a really long time because you're doing all these integrations to get rid of the uh, parameters. Sampler 1 and 2 were sort of competitive with each other, but sampler 1 ended up being, across most simulations, the best. Okay, so now pictures, <laughs> after tons and tons of equations. I'm going to use a motivating example, which is quite simple because it is just two-dimensional. It's a simple linear regression. We have an outcome y, which is acceleration, and a single covariate uh, x, which is time. And what we're looking at here is measurements of acceleration at times after a simulated motorcycle accident. So this was this is the M cycle data from the mass library in R, if you're interested. And it's a useful one because there are change points. There's heteroskedasticity. There's you know there's all sorts of stuff that's going on. So it's a nice one, and also because two dimensions we can visualize nicely. So it's available from Schmidt at all 1981. X is time in milliseconds, and Y is the head acceleration, which sounds slightly horrific, of the test object in, in gravity. Okay, so points are obviously not regularly spaced. Uh, you can see a lot more points bunched up here than there are down here. You have multiple observations at certain time points. You can see the heteroskedasticity, right? There's huge variability at the end, but at the beginning, there's not a lot of variation, right? It's almost a perfect line. So this, this definitely doesn't work if you assume homoskedasticity. It is definitely not a simple linear regression. So a single, if we replaced our mixture with a single linear regression, this would not do well. We have multiple change points, which suggests that we should be splitting this up into multiple different sections to model with our lines. And we've got a difference in terms of um, transition. So we have a really abrupt transition here, right? At 21, it goes from being downward pointing to being very upward pointing. Here, it seems to change fairly gradually, so there's a smooth transition. So there's all sorts of things going on in this little example. 
And as I said, we can break it down into stages. You know, here we're basically having zero acceleration. We have mass, then followed by massively increasing deceleration, increasing acceleration, and then dropping again, and then more or less leveling out. So we could say we have stage one, two, three. This could be potentially modeled by one expert or two. So four or five experts from visual inspection seems reasonable for this. Okay, priors. As I said before, multivariate normal is our thing for the gauging parameters. We've said that they're zero again because we're saying that we don't, I priori believe there's particular covariate effects. And we have a slightly smaller variability for the intercept and defense slopes. For the beta vector and sigma squared, we have our normal inverse gamma. Again, zeros and fairly large variances and a slightly bigger um, scale and, and um, rate parameter as well. So if we do random starts, this is what we get. We did three random starts. So this is showing that, you know, we did our very best. We tailored everything. I think you'd agree that most of these are not good, right? So what we're seeing in the thick lines is basically the average across all of our iterations for these particular um, HMEs. The thin lines are essentially just pull, pulls of iterations for every tenth sample. So the bloom seems to get, you know, the first stage well, and then just models basically the next three stages by a single line. And then you sort of have a line at the end. So it's doing start in the beginning well. The green is not capturing the beginning well, but it's capturing that abrupt change between deceleration and acceleration well. Red. I mean, if you just fit a simple linear regression, that's what you get. I have a feeling that the allocation variables for some of those experts are zero for everything. So that's pretty much what's going on here. So it is quite difficult if you're just randomly starting. So here we just randomly generated allocation variables and randomly generated starting points for our betas and sigmas and gammas. This is what you get. And, you know, there's no particular reason why you have would have an intuition where to start in these things, right? So... This is a problem that's, you know, MCMC in and of itself, when you have a fixed architecture, it's still quite hard. Weirdly, making it more difficult by adding reverse jump and allowing automatic detection improves that because it actually improves the acceptance and convergence. These things did actually converge, we checked, um, in spite of our disbelief. It's showing how sensitive these things are. And it's probably that the fact that they're not mixing across the different modes of the likelihood. For example, that red one, basically fixed in one mode where everything was in one expert and didn't move to any of the other modes where there were more spread of observations in different experts. So we finally get on to the architecture to change. So this is going to come from versatile jump Markov chain Monte Carlo. The idea is we can have a different number of experts, we can have different tree depths, we can have different structures. And so we could start with essentially a simple two expert, one gate, weak node structure, and then allow it to grow. Or we could start out with a very complex structure and try and prune it back, or we can just let it do what it wants to do. So how we change is basically from merging and splitting moves. So the merging move basically takes two experts that have the same gate parent and says, okay, actually we don't need both of these. We just merge them. And so that gate parent becomes a single expert that models all of that data. So that's a backward um, reversible jump step. Splitting is where we're growing the tree. We take one of the experts and say, actually, this is too complex. A single expert isn't actually modeling this very well. So we're going to split it into two more experts. So that becomes a gate, and there are now two experts to allow for a little bit more complexity in the model. And that's what's known as a forward jump. We have to be able, for a reversible jump, the reversibility is important. We have to be able to go from merge to split, basically. So you have to be able to do both. Just coming back to our original architecture, suppose that we have this expert here and there's a ton of observations that land. At. Maybe that was our red line. Everything else was zero and suddenly, for some reason, everything is here. We want to split that. And so essentially, we do a reversible jump. We, we replace e, E5 with gate 5 now. And we have two nodes that are new, which are E5 new and E6. And so that's our forward reversible jump. And then we can do the reverse as well. So we can take a particular gate that has two terminal nodes and move those terminal nodes and replace those with a single expert. And that's our backward step. So that's all we're doing when we're doing this automatic architecture selection. Okay. So the nice thing about reversible jump is 
it allows you literally to jump between plausible models. They don't have to be nested. You know, in, in some sense, as long as you can move backward and forward in, the, in a reversible way, you can compare any of these. Now, obviously, we set these up to be nested because it's a lot easier to do. But arguably, you can jump between plausible models which have, as we saw, different dimensionalities. So here we have four gates and five nodes. If we split it, we have five gates and six nodes. So that's obviously changed the amount of parameters that we're going to model because we have an extra set of gating parameters and we have another set of expert parameters. So we can't use MCMC on this because MCMC assumes that we're always in the same parameter dimension. So that's where the reversal jump comes in. In order to be able to do that, we need to be able to model the density. Um, so we have our F and theta, which will be our HME here. We need a transformation between a set of parameters between our original model and our new model. So going from theta to theta star for the old model M to the new model M star. And so we need to be able to basically explicitly say how that's done. And then we, once given an initial model with associated parameters, this is what we have for the general framework for reversible jump. So we iterate this over a long number of steps, T. We start by saying, okay, we have a particular architecture at the moment. We're going to update using MCMC the parameters of that model. We then say, okay, we're going to choose a new model or propose a new model M star with a particular probability. And we'll talk about how we set those probabilities up for HMEs particularly in a minute. And then we're going to generate a sort of perturbation, which is delta, which goes again from M star MT to the proposed MT minus one to the proposed model. We use that transformation such we talked about before to transform parameters from the current model to the proposed model. So we get this new set of parameters and this new delta star based on these original parameters and this original perturbation. So this is where we, we can reverse, we can go backwards. And then we have essentially an updated version of Metropolis Hastings acceptance probability. You know, we have the ratio of our posterior uh, model probabilities we then have the probabilities of going from the new model to the old model divided by the probabilities of going from the old model to the new model. And then there's an essentially a, a correction for the fact that we're changing dimensions. Given that acceptance parameter, we can then say, okay, if we accept, we set the newest iteration T model to this M star the proposed model, set the parameters to be that as well. Otherwise we stick with the same one. So it's very similar to the Metropolis Hastings with a twist, basically. It's easier to describe if I use a particular um, example. So we're going to take a look at this for HMEs of normal data. So if we have a single MCMC iteration, and I'm going to illustrate a problem with this here, um, let's say we have three experts. We have this pale blue in the left-hand side, we have this pale purple in the right-hand side, and we have the middle as all one expert, which is obviously not a very good model. This is what the average will look like. So we might want to split. We want, might want to increase the number of experts to better model the complexity that we're missing in the center. How do we propose that? How do we propose where we split? And once we split, how do we propose what those gating parameters look like and what those experts look like? So if we do this at random, we could choose a point and say, okay, we're going to split here. But if I do that, it could be any one of these points, right? I split here, this is not going to be a very interesting split. This is not going to be likely to be accepted because we're already modeling this well enough. I'll talk about how we do this later, but ideally what we want to do is we want to pick a particular expert and say, okay, this is a lot of data points. It's not modeling well. I want to split somewhere in here. Given the split, we then need to propose new regression lines for our experts, right? And again, if we're doing random stuff, great, we've picked a great split, but we're not going to accept those because those look nothing like the actual data. So this is where the problem comes in with reversible jump Markov chain Monte Carlo. If you approach it really naively and just do random stuff, your acceptance rate is going to be pathetic, like really bad. And I, I'm not kidding. I'll show you an example later. So we need to set up some sensible ways of doing this. Before we do that, we need some priors. Um, so we want here to put a prior on the number of experts. We want to control how complex the tree is going to be. And the usual prior specified for this is a Poisson with uh, rate lambda. And so obviously you then have an expected number of uh, experts equal to lambda. So you pick that according to how much you think, how much complexity you think. So here we might set lambda equal to four or five because the motorcycle data, that made sense. 
the effect then we remember from the acceptance probability we take a ratio of these things so then that's just going to be equal to the number of new experts experts in the new model divided by the number of experts in the old model times lambda to the power of the difference in those number of experts but with a binary tree if we're splitting we always just essentially add one or if we're merging we subtract one expert so if the new model is splitting, then this is just going to be lambda over number of experts in the old model. If the new model, on the new model rather, if the new model is merging, then it's going to be the number of experts in the old model divided by lambda. So it's putting pressure in different ways in terms of splitting and merging. We also want to talk about, as I said before, which experts should we be picking to split and merge? So splitting, we made the sort of assumption that if we've got a tiny number of observations, probably not going to want to split that expert. We want to pick experts where we have a large number of observations because we have a greater chance that there's more complexity there. So we basically chose our probability, prior probability of splitting a particular expert is equal to the number of observations that fall into that expert plus small value delta divided by the number of experts in the tree. So the larger NE is, the more likely that expert is to be randomly proposed to split. For merging, then we have a pair of experts. So we obviously have a parent gate G star for that pair. And we basically say, okay, this is one over the number of observations in that gate plus delta. If that's too big, then we probably don't want to be merging the two experts. If it's small, then we do want to be merging them. And that's making a fairly simplistic assumption that, you know, large number of observations, complexity, small numbers, it's not, which isn't always true, but it's usually pretty useful. So. The acceptance rate obviously depends hugely on how good the proposal is to the new state. Reversible jump mark of chain mark, I'm left out of alpha C, mark of chain Monte Carlo, um, has a big problem with low acceptance rates for random jumps. So the forward jump, when we're trying to split a, a particular gate, we choose the location randomly and then we propose the gating parameters. That's the step we do. If we're doing a reversible jump, that is the backward jump, we obviously don't have to do that because we're removing a gate, essentially. We don't have to propose gating parameters. So forward proposal basically says, OK, if we're in a particular gate uh, expert, we have observations that have been allocated to that expert, and we're going to call those observations i1 to i n star for total number of n star. From those observations, we're going to draw one at random. We're going to say at that observation, that's where a split is going to happen. So we have a random you know, uniform random here, so we know the probability of picking, picking that particular one. We can then draw the vector of slope parameters from multivariate normal. We talked a little bit about how we do that in terms of the iteratively weighted least squares as proposal. And then you just um, essentially mechanicalistically calculate what the implied intercept is from that, on the basis of that proposed uh, slope parameter and perturb that slightly by adding a little bit of noise. So we know what the noise is for that. The larger we set the covariance parameter for our proposal, the more potential there is for really sharp slopes. Um, so really sharp um, cuts between the different experts. Smaller values will allow for smoother transitions. So you have to sort of play with this a little bit. And then you can define the joint PDF of the proposal here. So what's happening is, OK, I've got a set of observations belonging to a particular expert. I randomly propose a single point from those here I've been really lucky, I've you know, picked one at the exact point. Then I randomly create the vector of intercepts and slopes, and we see what the actual gating looks like. So here it's been shifted slightly. So there's slightly more probability of points being in this right split than there is in the left split. But it's still not a bad proposal for gating, nonetheless. All right, last slide of equations, I promise. So this is the specific forward jump version of reversible jump marker of chain Monte Carlo uh, for Gaussian experts. We assume that we've randomly chosen an expert to split. So that's E dash. We're going to update those expert parameters so that they're the best uh, guess of what we have at the moment. We know which points are belonging to that, and we're only going to use those from now on. So using the algorithm that we just suggested, then we're going to randomly choose a point. We're going to randomly propose a reasonably sensible gating parameter for that new gate. That then implies certain mixing proportions for these new experts that are coming from that split of that gate. You, and we use those new gating parameters that we just estimated in three to actually do that. So we assign the points based on those mixing proportions. And now we know not 
just the points that were assigned to the original gate to how they're assigned to these new experts that we've just created. Given those allocations, we find the maximum likelihood estimates weighted for the expert regression and variance parameters to give us nice proposals for those parameters because we don't have any previous ones to work from. So that's coming back to the iteratively weighted least squares approach. So in our Gaussian case, that's just going to look like this. And so we have our best guess, our maximum likelihood estimate be the hat. And then we have our variance covariance matrix, which looks pretty familiar. And similar thing for the inverse gamma here, we have particular posteriors because of the conjugacy. So we propose new betas from that. So now we have our new expert parameters. So we have everything. So we can calculate all the priors and model probabilities. And we have then our acceptance ratio uh, to create whether or not we're going to accept this proposal. So the ratio of these new models to the old model, and then the probabilities of essentially merging from the old model to the new new model to the old, and then probability splitting from the old model to the new. And after an old and nasty algebra, you get a probability. You randomly accept or reject with the probability alpha. And so, you know, if we reject, we then stay in the same model architecture we had before. If we accept, we now split that gauge and have these two new experts. So coming back to what we had in our last example, uh, we have that nice proposal here, which was from this point here. And we are going to propose two new regression lines, and this is what it looks like, based on that iteratively weighted least squares best estimate. So it looks pretty good. It's likely that this will be accepted. As... And I'm not going to go into the backward. It's sort of an inverse of what we were doing before. And I only have so much time, and you have only so much patience for equations. So we're going to stick with this. So if we run this a while, we end up with a five expert model, which looks pretty good. So we have this initial stage, the pale blue then the green, the orange, black, and purple. And the average HME prediction line looks possible. So I told you that naively going into reversible jump Markov chain Monte Carlo is bad. Those are the acceptance rates for splits and merges at all, 0.6%. Here we're randomly, by the way, uh, uh, at each reversible jump stage, choosing either to split or to merge. So we end up, this is why it's, so awful in the previous one, we end up with 99% of the models with only two experts, which isn't enough for this particular data. And so that's what it looks like. So we essentially have one line here and one straight line. And that's doing the best it can for given the fact that it's only two experts, but it's not great. Intelligence, it's 20 times better. I mean, it's still not fantastic. 12% is not a super exciting acceptance rate, but when you had 0.6% core, we were pretty happy. So yeah. And we end up with something sensible. So we have 72% of the model have four experts, which is reasonable for this, assuming that they're right four, of course. 21% um, with three, which is a little low, and then 5.6% with five, and just under 1% with six experts. So this is what the sort of jump looks like. So we have 500 randomly proposed splits and merges. So we initially start by going from four up to five, then dropping, then staying at four for a while, then dropping to three, and so on. So this is what it looks like. It does not look like a hairy caterpillar, but that's not entirely surprising for this. So this is what the final model averaged across all the iterations with different numbers of experts and so on looks like, not just for the five, but for you know the three, the four, the five, the six. The red line is the average across all iterations for the prediction, and the black lines are sort of random poles of predictions for particular iterations. Not bad. What's nice about it is this. So, I mean, in some ways, we've created a, a nicely adaptive mean surface, which can be done by GAMS, really. I mean, it can. What we have here is an adapt adaptation to heteroscedasticity. So here we have very small prediction intervals. They widen out the right range, and they narrow again. So this is where we get an advantage, really, in the inference. Look at splines from GAMS and Bayesian additive regression trees, which are our natural competitor. You know, spines really don't adapt to the heteroscedasticity. It's more or less the same fixed width throughout with a little bit of narrowing. Similarly with BART, it's not quite as bad, but it's not great. Free admission, we didn't quite manage to meet BART in terms of MSC. So in terms of predictions, our mean squitter wasn't quite as good as BART, but I think that's more than made up for by the fact that we're properly modeling the heteroscedasticity. Interpretability, it's 
nice, I mean, Ivana has created this cool shiny app, which I'll show a link to at the end, where essentially you can look, interrogate each thing, look at where the probabilities of particular observations along the covariate are of being in the experts. So, you know, here we can see there's a lot of probability of being in that red expert, first expert, up until just after minus one. Then when we go from minus one to zero, you're more likely to be in that second expert green. And this is what those lines look like. And those are what prediction intervals look like. So this is where the interpretability is really coming out. You know, if you have a GAM, you've got a surface, but you don't have a relationship between the variables that it's really interpretable. Whereas here you can say, okay, well, if I'm in the first phase, there's no effect of time. Second phase, there's suddenly dramatic decreasing effect and so on. Remember the three random starts, the horrendous ones? This is what they look like when you run them through round reversible jumps. So it can be useful and it basically improves the mixing of the model in a huge way. More or less finishing on time. So HMEs, I won't lie, are really difficult to fit in Bayesian setting. You saw from the three random starts, we did the best we could in terms of tailoring proposals and things like that, and it still needed more. You, there's no reason why you would actually know what the tree structure looked like in advance. I, even with like a simple model, you wouldn't miss. I could see there were five experts, but I didn't know how the hierarchy lined up in a tree. So that automatic architecture really is needed for this to actually be useful in cases where you can't line up with that sort of prior information. But you still need something more. You can't just do naive jumps because the acceptance rate just craters. So this is where what we did in Ivana's thesis hopefully helps to ameliorate that. So nice thing is, you don't have to specify the architecture for the tree. And as an HME, it will adapt to areas where there are more complexity in the problem and less as well. It's competitive with BART, but will it not beat it? But it does allow for varying variants, which BART really doesn't do. It's more interpretable than competitors. Downsides, it's slow fitting. You know, we're running these things for thousands of iterations in order to converge. You need to tailor the priors and posteriors really carefully. Um, so you do have to tinker with that, even if you've got convergence. One thing I glossed over entirely was how do you do a reversible jump? When do you do a jump and when do you do the XUI MCMC where you're fitting the parameters? So we jumped around with, you know, doing 10 steps of MCMC followed by a randomly proposed jump. Or you can do randomly proposed three jumps and then 100 steps. You know, there's all sorts of things you can think about there, which I mentioned. These are the references I promised you. So the first is Ivana's thesis, which is a really nice introduction to the ideas of all these HMEs. It has a great discussion of maximum likelihood estimation of them, as well as the Bayesian. Classical um, references of the Harp mix mixture of experts and RJ MCMC. This is really cool. So this is the one I was telling you about, the Shiny app. Will it allow me to do this? which basically allows you to, to create plots that interrogate these things. So iteration 499 looks like this. We can add bounds. We can show the splits and the gate parameters, this sort of thing. So it allows you to do predictions and like that. So it's kind of a, a cool thing. Yeah. Great. It's just, everything was going so smoothly up to that point. All right, so that is essentially that shiny app there. And I'm not going to try push my luck and talk about gate swaps because that will get me hounded out of the gate. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nina and Mark. It's uh, pure divorce. Possibly too much, but you know. Well, Audrey, I can see. I, I see. Uh, how long has it taken to change the All right. Um, here. So initially we were propping in our objects orientated framework, but we decided to do C++ and I'd say we, Ivana, did all of this mm -hmm. um, because it's the object orientation works so well with the assignment of things and connections with these tree architectures. Mm -hmm. So it's, it took, a, I mean, a good year to, 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 to code that, that up. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't short. Yes. But the, uh, so that, that's interesting. Thank you. We were doing uh, RJMCMC 20K off years ago. We were working with Fortran. Oh, okay, yes. <laughs> so I still have some code. I don't know if it works. 
that's uh, very interesting that you're also accommodating modeling the, uh, the bearings as well as the beam. I think that's the big strength of this, yeah. Yeah, yeah but it's not from, uh, it's, it's not from God. Some, sometimes uh, you may have long beach removed data. Yeah. <laughs> what? It, you could adapt to that, certainly, yeah. Yes. If you have, uh, if you have long beach removed data, you may decompose the variance. And you may model the variance and you add all the covariance structure. Yeah, now that would be really interesting to do. That's, that's why I wrote the expression for the acceptance probability. Probability would be great. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but you, I mean, I, I, sorry to interrupt. You, you're, you're right. This is a very simple one that we just put simple in your regression. You could obviously do some linear mix models. You can fit all of these frameworks in GLM and survival models. Each of those can be expert models. This is just a sort of example, yeah. Truly, whatever Yeah. I noticed that for Vicky Dagger, she talked about other two people that are working on our team. Oh, right. Okay. An expert. So it, in the sections where you're proposing uh, status that are such you're only about kind of the data points that are affected by data points mm -hmm. in the whole um, And in a lot of data points, do you find that the likelihood kind of takes a little bit of fire because that happens a lot of my data? And so it's like, it almost feels like just like a likelihood of regime test. It, it can do, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it, I think if you start off with a simpler model, sometimes that tends to happen. I think if you start off with a more complex model, that not so much, mm -hmm. but it can still, yeah, essentially get get drowned out and, and plunged to something simpler. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. That's a good point. I've forgotten that we actually seen that. Yeah. Sir, sorry, questions in the chat. This is where I'm in trouble. You heard that. And it did not go what? Let's see, chat. Nope. <laughs> I was I'm sorry. I hope everyone could hear me online. Um, I tend to forget <laughs> once I get started. We can hear you fine. Absolutely fine. Uh, yeah. And it takes takes me some time, I think, to absorb the outcome. Yeah, it's it's a lot. <laughs> That's why I tend to spend a lot of time with three plots because I think it's easier to sort of visualize and yeah. Well, we'll question. Doesn't seem to be. Well, let's thank Dina again. Okay.